this over to Dr. Fawcett and um, he'll talk for a while and then we'll take questions. So like I said, um, type your questions into the Q&A feature early um, and that way you know we'll get to it. All yours. Okay, thank you, Scott. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm David, as Scott mentioned, today in the Seeking Integrity offices in Los Angeles. So happy to be out here. And um, uh, so a different background, but here I am. Uh, so it's always interesting to see the themes when I get to spend time with the guys in, in the residential treatment program. And one of the things that's always been a big task for any addict in recovery is developing empathy. And it's always a struggle for people. It's, we, we have several um, programmatic things we do to kind of bolster that process. But I wanted to talk a little bit about empathy tonight, just what it is, kind of why we need it, what, what, what's it good for. Um, and so just very simply to define it first, you know, develop, empathy is that ability to step into someone else's shoes and actually feel what they're feeling and see things from their perspective. And it's, it's a pretty unique attribute. Humans certainly have it. It's one of the things that sets us apart. Other, a few other higher order mammals appear to have it as well. But, but empathy really allows us, um, it's an incredible skill or talent or gift that allows us to really connect with people at a deeper level and to really understand them and know what's going on with them. And it, it really, I think, opens the door or enables us to develop relations uh, that are much more intimate. It allows us to feel connected with people, to establish long lasting bonds. And it's really essential for our um, coming together. And of course, with addiction, one of the consequences of, of addictive behavior is, is a lot of strain on relationships. And one of the things we see that goes pretty quickly by the wayside with sex porn addiction and chem sex addiction is the ability to have empathy. People do things that um, uh, are dismissive and hurtful and destructive to other people um, without uh, much awareness. And if there is awareness, uh, it's kind of hard to get in touch with the feeling part of that. So one thing we see often here in treatment is uh, when people do connect with the realization of the impact that their behavior has had on the people they love, it can be a really devastating thing. But it's a really uh, a necessary thing to reconnect uh, to, to those feelings and to really understand what's going on. So it's a really incredibly important thing. And it is one of the first casualties of some of these addictive disorders. So, so that's, that's what it is. Um, uh, sometimes people confuse empathy with, with other things. You know, empathy is not um, being kind. Uh, kindness is a good thing. Uh, it's not pity. It's not um, other kinds of relations. It's this distinct ability to really step into someone's feelings and understand what they must be experiencing. And that really, as I say, is a really incredible, incredibly uh, important human aspect. What's um, interesting to me, and I kind of like brain science stuff, um, over the last 10 years or so, there's been a lot of research on the so-called empathy circuit. You know, for 20 years ago, we, we discovered the reward circuitry, which is basically a, this linkage of different structures in our brain uh, that are connected with these different neural pathways that allow us to experience reward, meaning dopamine flow. And that's also pivotal to the uh, development of addiction. Uh, empathy is this also, is, it's not just one area of the brain, it's, a, it's different structures in the brain that are wired together. But the kind of the star of the show of the empathy circuit are mirror neurons, which are these little um, specialized little neurons in our temporal lobes right up here on the side that actually, I don't know that we really understand them totally and how they work, but they are the mechanics of what allow us to really read other people. And I think there's much, much more to be discovered about empathy in the brain and, and how it works. And there's a lot of research now on how we can uh, teach empathy as part of curriculum in schools to kind of help kids develop it. But anyway, it's, a, it's kind of cutting edge right now, but it's incredibly important stuff. So how do, we, how do we learn, how should we learn empathy? A lot of addicts have trouble with it. You know, we're really primed for empathy in the first couple of years of our life. And those are, the relationships with our primary caregivers, which really set the tone and set the pace for how we relate and attach, um, the word we use is attached to other people through the rest of our lives, including our intimate relationships when we get older. So that a lot of those trends, those patterns are really set early on. Um, and if we are successfully kind of wired for empathy, then we have a much better leg up in terms of um, social cooperation, mutual aid, 
feeling connected, not feeling isolated, not being as lonely, not being as depressed. So it's a really important set of skills that we develop. So I think in recovery, it's really important to make empathy kind of a, a look at as an attitude that's, that's really important everyday part of our lives to really consciously uh, practice empathy and in incorporate it. So there's, in the research, there's some interesting habits. You know, everybody remembers those kind of seven habits of highly effective people. If we look at habits of people who have a lot of empathy, um, some patterns. Uh, one is they tend to be curious about strangers. So there's a curiosity about getting to know somebody else. What, what are you feeling? What are you doing? You know, what's your story? Um, and kind of just, just a gentle curiosity without judgment, but just this willingness to connect and be curious and explore and just be open. So I think that, that, that uh, impetus to, to reach out. Um, we know that um, they often are willing to challenge prejudices and more in 12-step in program, we talk about not looking for uh, what sets us apart, but what we have in common with people around the room. And people that have the ability and inherent ability for empathy really are able to do that to a much greater extent. They, they can discover our, our commonalities. They have kind of what I call you know, beginner's mind, no, no preconceptions about things, no judgments, no assumptions, but just kind of really being open to the reality. Um, they practice in a way, kind of trying on someone else's life, you know, just really active, using active imagination to kind of just take a, a couple seconds, think well, what, what would that experience be like? You know, what would it be like to have been born in that country and come here or to have this kind of experience or to have, um, that kind of experience as a child, or just, just to be curious about putting ourselves in their shoes. And I think that's a, that's a skill that can be practiced and that can be improved upon. So I think that's, that's another uh, piece. And then maybe the most important skill-based aspect of empathy is listening skills, really learning how to be a good listener, how to really hear um, what we call active listening, where we um, kind of express interest and we're engaged in people that, that we're listening to. So those are really, really habits um, uh, that I think are essential uh, to develop empathy. So a couple other things and guidelines to help us develop it um, really is to, to experience the major differences in people. You know, what, what sets us all apart? You know, what, what, uh, how do we vary? What are our experiences been? What can we learn from people that are, are different or have had different experiences or different viewpoints? Um, learning to identify our own feelings is another one. That's, I guess we could call that emotional intelligence, really understanding how we feel, um, how we um, differentiate between thoughts and feelings. Uh, so ideas versus emotions and sensations. Um, being able to distinguish between related emotions. You know, one of the things we observe with uh, addicts in early recovery is that they're not very good at identifying specific and discrete emotions. We have, we've talked about this before, little emoji cheat sheets of, of feelings to identify because it's a really difficult thing for addicts to kind of differentiate that. But really kind of developing um, a language of emotion, I think is really important. I, I think of it as almost like learning a foreign language, really learning these feelings. What, is it, what does it actually mean? What are these distinctions? between um, relaxation and boredom, for example, and what are the kind of finer uh, aspects of that and kind of starting to differentiate some of those in a way that kind of increases our ability to um, experience not only our own range of emotions uh, internally, but with, within other people as well. And so I think that that ability is really gonna be important. And then perhaps the most important of that in terms of developing is regularly asking other people about their perspectives and their feelings. And that goes back to that idea of being, being curious. What is, um, what's your story? You know, what, what are you feeling? And why do you feel that way? Just being genuinely curious and, and inqu inquisitive, asking people what's going on with them. And I think if we do that enough, it becomes kind of a, a way of life. We become polished at it and it becomes more automatic. I think in early recovery, especially if that empathy has been damaged or uh, impaired somehow, it's a real challenge to kind of get over the hump and start to establish that. But I think um, it's, it's important to ask their perspectives. And then one of the trick I sometimes use with my clients, if I'm, if I'm encouraging them to talk to people, ask, asking other people about their perspectives to really, you know, silently compare what I thought they might say with what they said. So in other words, um, it's always kind of a self-correcting action of like comparing what I expected with the reality. And by doing that over and over again, we start to really deepen our ability to 
they have um, powerful interconnections and relationships with other people. So there's probably a lot more to say about empathy, but um, I don't want to talk on too long. But it's just it's a critical uh, aspect of recovery, and I think probably quality of life too. Uh, if we are walking through life kind of on our own, disconnected, that's ultimately not a very fun uh, place to be. So uh, empathy is huge, and um, I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, David. It is, um, it's turned out to be yesterday and today are like empathy days. Um, uh, I taught my level three work group last night and I was supposed to teach about pro-dependence, but ha having just finished a huge, humongous project dealing with nothing but pro-dependence, I just couldn't stomach it. So I took next week's lecture, which was on values and empathy, oh, cool. um, mostly empathy and, and higher power, which I, I think those three things go together. But um, and it was funny. So so we spent most of the time talking about empathy, which always happens with that lecture. And two of the guys had been to couples therapy earlier in the day, and they had spent their hour there talking about empathy. So it's a you know yeah. higher power sometimes tells us what we're supposed to do. Yeah, seriously, that's funny. Um, so. I have some I have some questions. By the way, type questions into the QA feature about empathy or anything else to do with addiction and recovery. Um, between David and I, we can pretty much answer any question. Um, and if we don't know, we'll we'll just tell you we don't know. Um, so yeah, you talked about um, mirror neurons and IDing own, own, our own feeling. Well, you talked about IDing our own feelings. Uh, did you mention the Columbia study with with meth addicts? No, I didn't. Can, um, can you talk about that and how bad addicts can really get at, at not just identifying someone else's feelings, but our own? I mean, we can get just so horrible at it. Yeah, that's a really powerful thing. Thank you, Scott. I forgot about that. It was actually NYU, not Columbia, but... Was it? Okay. Uh, I knew it was in New York City somewhere. Yeah, New York City. It's NYU did a study on self-identified methamphetamine addicts studying their level of empathy. And one thing we know about empathy, meth, and it's really just... The same process as we see a diminishment of empathy in sex and porn addicts, just meth is kind of on steroids because it's such a more, more potent drug, but it, it causes even more damage. But what they found with meth addicts, they gave them, um, they projected faces, the same guy's face with different emotions, happy, sad, disappointed, angry, hurt, whatever. And asked the, the meth users to identify what emotion the face was, was portraying. And meth addicts were basically largely impaired. They could not identify or distinguish among uh, different faces, whether it was happy, sad. Uh, they, they were unable to kind of read those, the facial expressions, read the social cues. And because of the paranoia that goes with meth, a lot of them basically assumed the expression was hostile. Even if it was, say, somebody smiling at them, they assumed it was kind of an evil smile that the person was about to do something aggressive. So it was a total mismatch of, of um, the accurate emotions and a real uh, misreading of social cues. You know, one other thing about meth, just to drive the point home, um, there's a, you know, meth of course is used by a lot of gay men, but it's also used by a huge amount of people in rural America, increasingly so, more than opioids in, in the West Coast of the United States now, more meth overdoses, more meth seizures and so on. But meth really impacts not just gay men and, and empathy, but there's a staggering statistic about the uh, amount of child abuse in uh, places in heterosexual communities where there's a lot of meth methamphetamine use. And basically um, parents become so disconnected from their own children that they're much more um, likely to impose violence or be physically abusive to those kids because they kind of are disconnected from them as human beings. Um, so it's, it's profound uh, in terms of meth. And, and we see, as I say, similar dynamics, just maybe not as extreme with sex and porn addicts. Although, you know, you talk to a partner, of, a traumatized partner of a sex addict that's um, where the, the behavior sometimes has gone on for years is extremely hurtful and uh, dismissive and demeaning, in fact, sometimes. And the, the addict is kind of disconnected from the, the awareness of that, the feelings. Uh, they, they usually know what's happening intellectually, but they can't feel it. And so, yeah, that's what we do in, in treatment. That's the work we do. Do you think the intensity of meth or cocaine uh, or sex or porn um, 
kind of pushes us away from empathy because empathy is it's just it's just so much more subtle than like the intent that huge dopamine adrenaline rush from an intensity addiction. Uh, yeah, I, th I think the intensity is a big part of it because it really drives, it almost narrows our focus. You know, we become real tunnel vision on what we want uh, in those addictions driven by that you know, rush for dopamine. So I think we kind of lose lose all the kind of human niceties around the edge, you know, including empathy and, and the ability to connect and be, you know, kind and courteous and all those kind of higher order emotions, I think kind of fall by the wayside. And I, I think largely because they're, they can't compete with the bright intensity of the addiction and those you know, dopamine that results from it. Yeah, and this is a question I got yesterday and I'm interested to hear when I was teaching and I'm interested to hear your response to it. Do addicts become addicts because they lack empathy or do they lose empathy because they become addicts? Right? Chicken or the egg here or both? Great question. Um, I think it's probably both. Although I can tell you for sure, the addictive process is really devastating to empathy. It really kind of destroys it. Um, so addiction definitely has an impact, a negative impact on empathy, be it how much um, that, how much a lack of empathy contributes to the development of addiction, you can probably make a case for that too. Um, so I think it's probably both. But I think the addictive process itself does the most damage in terms of doing in empathy. That's that's the answer. I can't honestly be right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I you know, I when I think back to my life, you know, there was not a lot of empathy in my house. You know, it wasn't modeled for me, so I didn't really develop any empathy. Whatever empathy I naturally had was probably there. But um, you know, when I became an addict, I, I became very, very self-focused and, and um, you know, it's not that I didn't care about other people and it's not that I wanted to hurt other people. It's just, I cared more about myself and, and mostly about my addiction and needed to protect that above everything else. And I think that's really common for addicts is, you know, sex addicts don't mean to hurt their, their, their betrayed partners. You know, they don't mean to ruin their relationships, but you know, that need uh, to protect the addiction and and to be able to escape, you know, at will, it just overruns everything else. And, and I think that happens with all addictions. But yeah, I think of addiction when you have an addiction in your life, it's really your primary relationship. Right? You can be married to someone, but you know, you know your lover is the addiction, and, and that you protect that first. And yeah. I think that's that's the sad truth of a lot of active addiction. Yeah, you're right. I'll protect my addiction over you um, because it's. Sadly, in that moment, it's more important. You know, if you if you sit an addict down and actually question them about their values, that's why we, oh, I like to talk about values along with empathy. You know, they realize that that you know protecting their addiction is completely out of whack with who they want to be um, and who they who they think they are. Um, but then you know, it's like oh, reality hits them in the face. So we've got some questions. In the, I have several more questions about empathy, but I'm going to go to the Q and A. Because uh, I don't want to leave anybody out. So keep typing them in and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, have you heard of havening? <laughs> and if so, do you think it's a legitimate way to handle trauma? Thank you for bringing that question back. It got asked last week and we did not have time. Um, so did you look it up, David? Because I did. <laughs> yeah, so I'll turn that over to you. <laughs> I actually looked it up. I was curious. So it's, it's a calming technique. It's a grounding technique. Um, you can type havening, H-A-V-E-N-I-N-G. You can Google it. But basically, you sort of hold yourself and you say peace, love, serenity, or you know, whatever little you know, calming mantra. And then you do this with your hands. And it sort of combines that physical sensation of comfort with some comforting words. Um, and I've tried it a couple of times this week and it really works well. Um, you know, it works as well as breath work and five, four, three, two, one grounding and some of the other techniques. So um, if you're somebody who has anxiety or, or I suggest checking it out and there's some great videos on YouTube and on havening.org. Um, so it's kind of cool. Cool, uh, thank you. One to, one, to, one to add to the repertoire. Repertoire, repertoire. I'm not sure. I don't speak French. <laughs> I think uh, <coughs> Excuse me. 
Uh, my husband had his last acting out um, with an 18 year old until she turned 19. Um, she was always high, mushrooms, weed. Uh, sometimes she was drunk and high. Um, his social media use and porn use escalated to drunk and high young girls. Um, this is behavior in women he always said disgusted him, like vaping and smoking, which she did. Um, he was always sober while she was not. How do we address this? I find it so very disturbing and his actions seemed manipulative and controlling with her. Um, I wonder if this sexual interest in damaged girls is something I can overcome. Uh, <coughs> so, thoughts, David? Yeah, so, you know, oftentimes we see um, in certain sex addicts, kind of this uh, a profile of um, being attracted to people who are vulnerable, people who could be maybe controlled, people who could be influenced, could, could be kind of dazzled by an, an adult, if you will. And I think it's um, it, it has to do with one of the uh, um, issues of power and control that we often see uh, in terms of sex addiction uh, and you know converge on exploitation and move quickly into the realm of offending and that kind of thing. But it, it's really, um, uh, sometimes it's framed as a kind of well-meaning gesture, people taking, um, you know, the, the old wounded bird syndrome or yet taking on people as a project to kind of help them and guide them and mentor them. And it, it's all tied up with power and control and, um, and gratification in that area. Now that's you know skirting with uh, the the line there with eighteen year olds is a pretty risky um, business, especially if they're intoxicated. So I mean there's there's I feel some there's some kind of dangerous territory here, uh, and I think it's something that would definitely need to be addressed. I, I I find it disturbing as well, and I think it's something that probably needs to be looked at in a therapeutic setting, uh, because the, this um, in my experience these kind of behaviors tend to escalate and go forward until they're Kind of actively interrupted with, with therapy or um, sometimes if it crosses the line, sometimes with the law. So um, I think it's just really important to recognize this as, as and, and it's often framed as help being helpful, right? Uh, but, but it's really manipulative and controlling and uh, exploiting, uh, taking advantage of, of someone. So I think, um, you know, can it be overcome? I'm, I'm always optimistic about things like that with therapy. But I think it's something that does need to be addressed. It's not something that will just kind of, uh, it's not a phase. It's not a, something that's benign. I think it's, it's really something that needs to be addressed because it's, it's problematic. Yeah, in my experience, both personal and uh, in my professional life, working with other, other people, is this is one of the ways that the, the addiction can escalate um, is, I call it hunting behavior. Um, and. I see it a lot with, um, you know, older, younger, or with sex workers, or you know, the, the financial power dynamic. Um, there's there's a hunting element that adds to the intensity, and and it sort of fits into the bubble of being in in the addiction. Um, you know, and uh, you know, I used to cruise around looking for prostitutes, and I would have the the nature documentary, the guy with the British accent, you know, and he separates one from the hood. And, you know, I'm, it's just that that was like the soundtrack going in my head was like that BBC nature documentary guy talking about, you know, the predator and the prey. And it was part of my addiction. And I'm, I'm not proud of that at all. Um, you know, I'm embarrassed by it and ashamed of it. And, you know, um, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, when your husband gets some recovery, <laughs> he will be like, "Oh, I can't believe you know was that me that did that." But um, yeah, I mean, it's not unusual for an addiction to escalate in this way. And yeah, I'm a, I'm a little worried, like David, because when you start flirting um, with the 18 line, uh, things can go south really quickly. Uh, so, and yeah. I think it's um, it illustrates the progression of the disease too, where uh, even your husband himself used to be kind of disgusted by this behavior, but that's yeah. not part of his repertoire. And so I think that's just shows how escalation occurs. And, you know, we become different people, um, yeah. and our taste change. And as we yeah, know, and sex addicts often find themselves um, chasing people that they really actually have no interest in, you know, in an objective way, they have no interest. It's just, 
it's the chase and it's it's the the zoning out and the getting out of your head that's important. Um, not, I mean, he's not searching for a relationship here. I mean, you know, uh, so yeah. So I'm sorry you're in that situation. I'm sorry he's in that situation. Um, I hope he, he will reach out and get some help. Um, recommended reading uh, for addicts <laughs> to help develop empathy or learn about emotional self-awareness. Um, Scott, you probably go, uh, can list more books off the top of your head. I always think of Brene Brown's work. I, that, that's where I go is to Brene. Yeah, whether it's TED Talks or, or, or numerous books, uh, YouTube videos, there's a ton of stuff out there that deals with developing empathy and its relation to some of our internal processes with shame and vulnerability and trust. And um, it's a really hugely important foundation for that. So I, I would go there first. Yeah. And then, yeah, actually, I saw this question. I went to our, our recommended books page on the Seeking Integrity site, which is really a, a full listing, seekingintegrity.com. Go to resources and books. Um, it's got a great listing of books. Um, and I could not find one specifically on empathy. Um, but I do recommend Brene Brown. And I also, um, for an addict, a male addict, particularly a male addict in a relationship, um, I would recommend Dr. Rob's book, Out of the Doghouse, um, because he talks a lot about how a, a male addict, and I think it applies to any addict, but can get in the betrayed partner's shoes, um, you know, and, and really feel uh, her pain. Um, so, um, okay, next one. Um, I have tried to be empathetic regarding my husband's addiction. However, my husband not only has exploited my empathy, he uses my empathy against me. He refuses to even attempt mirroring empathy when I ask for it. I found myself feeling emotionally used and drained. I no longer have empathy for my husband when he's telling me he resents me because he can't look at porn. Um, my reaction now is to mock him, which is the opposite of how I would like to react, but I feel like I've run out of empathy for him. Um, that's a tough one. Yeah, I'm sorry uh, you're in that position. I think it's not unusual. I think an addict can tax um, the sympathy and empathy and any kind of relational um, kindness of people pretty quickly uh, because it just it, it wears people out and it's not reciprocated as you as you point out here. And so I think um, yeah, and I think sometimes if you're in that addict frame of mind. Um, Empathy, you say he used it against you. Empathy can seem, uh, can appear to be a weakness to be exploited. Um, I think sometimes in that uh, African tundra scenario that Scott was just talking about, the, the prey and the predator and all that, I think empathy is kind of considered a weakness sometimes um, by people who are in addiction. That's not something to be proud of or, or certainly uh, aspire to. So I think. Um, yeah, I'm sorry that happened. And, you know, I can understand, you know, mocking him isn't what I would recommend as a therapist, but I can see how that would be a normal response. You just get, you're over it. And there's a, that's your anger, you know, obviously. Um, but, yeah, and, you know, I mean, we, we, we know the person who asked this question, and we know that this relationship, uh, the, the addict is not overly interested in recovery. Um, he's, you know, stopped some of his behaviors, but hasn't really done much work beyond that. So as the betrayed partner, um, if empathy is pointless, should she keep trying it? Um, or, is, or is there a time where you have to say, okay, empathy is not working, let's try something else? I, I don't know, I'm kind of... Right, I, th I think um, if you're in a situation like that where there's, there's kind of a, almost a degree, a degree of hostility, uh, it's not very conducive to empathy and kind of openness and um, or even a desire to really feel what somebody else is feeling. There's a, I think people drop into more of a protective mode and kind of put up some boundaries and, and barriers to kind of protect themselves. So I think at some point, uh, I think it's important to kind of self-preservation becomes more important than the desire to reach out and understand. And I think, um, especially if there's, if it's kind of being abused and um, and not respected. And so I think, yeah, I think in that case, I would guess I would say boundaries, put up boundaries of what you'll tolerate or not tolerate and, 
and what you're uh, willing to do so you don't constantly feel you know, taken advantage of or abused or mocked yourself or wh whatever the result is. But I think at some point, yeah, we have to kind of pull back a little bit and yeah, um, define our boundaries. So I'm going to ask one of my questions from earlier. Um, are women naturally better at empathy than men in a general way? I'm asking you to generalize, but is, is that typical? Um, you know, in a very general way, I would say yes. You know, we, we know that when we look at, at relational styles and how people um, interact, how they process information, how they process decisions, uh, women tend to be much more relational than men, meaning they may take an idea and process it with you know, three or four or five friends, or there's a lot more discussion and back and forth and uh, really kind of exploring it, I think, in a much more thorough and relational way, um, including empathy, than men tend to do, who maybe tend to um, jump to conclusions quickly, take action quickly, not process so much, but like strike out and um, do things independently. It's, it's kind of a very different style. So I think, you know, in, in very general terms, not that there's men who aren't very empathetic naturally and women who don't do it so well, but, but in general terms, uh, we know that uh, women tend to be much more relational um, and men less so. So I think, yeah, you can make, you can make a case that, um, and also I think just, this is where it gets so fascinating, right? Because there's um, kind of how we're hardwired based on our, our you know, human morphology, but but there's also cultural stuff, and and I think in, in our culture, um, I think men are not particularly cult acculturated to um, practice empathy. And, and again, I was talking before about how it's considered a weakness sometimes. I think a lot of in traditional kind of um, uh, male-oriented macho kind of culture, uh, empathy is not considered a plus. Uh, it's it's something. It's a vulnerability. So I think that that kind of cultural expectation makes it for a difference as well. Yeah, and you know, it's um, it's not that men can't do empathy when, and it's not that we don't naturally, I mean, I think men are very good at physical empathy. Um, I go back to my high school days, um, we were playing, it was a basketball game, full gym, I grew up in Indiana. Um, one of my friends jumped and came down on someone's shoulder with his groin area and went down in a heap. And I heard every male in the gym gasp and grab their own groin. And, you know, because every guy, we immediately felt that pain. Um, we empathized with that. Um, but the emotional stuff we tend to struggle with, whereas women, you know, will we'll just go right to the feelings and, and they'll surround each other and feel it together. And I'm kind of jealous, um, but, um, but you know, men can develop that, and David's right. Some some of the most empathetic people I know are male, and some of the least empathetic people I know are female. Um, but in, in a general way, so yeah. And at Sorry. least in that little introduction, I talked about emotional intelligence and that ability to kind of um, have some depth in that area and awareness. And I think um, <coughs> you know, that's not necessarily valued as much as it should be. I think for men in our culture. Um, yeah, man, we're, we're, we're taught to be, you know, cowboy up, you know, man up, don't show your emotions. There's a problem, just fix it. You know, if, if, if a woman gets a cancer diagnosis, all of her friends gather around and they, they cry and they hash it out. And, you know, a man gets a cancer diagnosis, he tells his friends and they say, when do you start chemo? I mean, that's, that's the end of the conversation. It's like we don't want to feel just go straight to the solution you know how are you going to fix it um yeah. so um anyway i took us down a rabbit hole there didn't i <laughs> how long does it take i love this question how long does it take sex addicts to become empathetic i would love to give an answer like you know 42.9 days or something <laughs> but, um, it, Boy, good question, because it just varies tremendously. I mean, it depends on kind of the starting point, the, the damage done by the addiction, the circumstances. I think um, one of the major barriers, I think, to developing real empathy is trauma. And if we have a trauma response, you know, we have all kinds of walls and defenses and blind spots kind of built in, which really impairs the ability 
for for empathy. So, I mean, it, it's there's so many variables there. Um, I think one of the things we do at Seeking Integrity is um, read. We ask loved ones, wives, husbands to write uh, an impact letter to to the person in treatment, and uh, these are very personal and powerful letters. We had one this morning that was extremely powerful, and and it can. I don't know, it's miraculous. In a group setting, it can, God, I swear, you can do a year's worth of outpatient therapy in one, <laughs> one group. I mean, people, you can break through years worth of kind of shell and crust and denial, you know, and very quickly. Um, and so when it works, it works, but uh, it doesn't always happen that quickly. But I think that's, that's the breakthrough. And then after the breakthrough, we need to work on Kind of developing it, fine tuning it, practicing it, and starting to apply it in different areas of our lives. So it, it's a broad process. I think um, generally, I, I think it, it's an essential piece for recovery. So I would say, you know, hopefully in the first six months, 12 months, people are getting a good handle on, on empathy and starting to relate in a healthier way to other people and, and uh, see themselves in other people as well, see how they relate, how they identify and not compare and contrast, but more, what do they have in common? So I think it's an essential skill and I think it's just highly variable. I'm sorry, I can't do it a specific answer, but um, it's, a, it's an important task. And I would hope within the first year, people have become pretty proficient at feeling it to some extent. So I wanna, I wanna pick up on one thing you said and then I wanna add something. Um, you mentioned like the impact letter that, that we require um, at, at Seeking Integrity for the, for, for the partner guys. Um, reading it in the group setting is really impactful, not just for the addict, but for the other guys in the room. Uh, it can be a real breakthrough for them. Just hearing someone else's impact letter can be really impactful and sometimes more impactful because they're so shut down in regard to their own relationship. Um, these, because I've been in some of those, and it's the other guys who are losing it. You know, <laughs> you know. Um, do, do you see that sometimes? Yeah, I mean, quite frequently, when uh, when a guy's wife says is has written a letter and it's being read to him, uh, they they kind of go into shock, right? They they kind of go numb. They they dissociate a little bit. It's it's traumatic in, in a way, and they they disconnect, and so they don't always hear it. So very often, if this morning in group, I was having to be the, the reader of the letter and I, you know, pause, I'd remind the person to breathe, you know, check in with them, are you listening, just so they're not zoned out. But to your point, um, everybody else in the group also is being affected by the experience and they, they're relating to their own wives' messages and how they might have hurt their own wives. And just like you said, Scott, it, sometimes they can really hear it because it's not them in the hot seat, if you will. And, they can relate to the letter more than the person actually to whom the letter was written. So yeah, absolutely. It's a healing experience for everybody. The, and the power of group therapy is just- It's amazing. And I think- uh, Incredibly one, underrated. Um, yeah, group is, group is totally where it's at, I, I think. You know, sometimes people are at first like appalled because these are, you know, private feelings and there's a lot of shame. And that's, that's the bottom line here. There's a lot of shame about what's going on and that other guys are going to hear kind of get a glimpse of this into the private dynamics of somebody's relationship. But, but the thing is by putting in the group setting, first of all, like Scott said, everybody benefits from it. Everybody heals. Everybody identifies. Nobody's judging. In fact, sometimes if people are really feeling shame, we'll go around and ask the person to make eye contact with every person in the group and are you judging me? Or, or the, they'll have, the therapist will prompt the other people to say, you know, do you judge this person? No, you know, when, and this is a universal experience when people are vulnerable like that, when people are hurting, what do we do? We don't run, we lean in, you know, I think, and that's another lesson of this impact letter process is that people realize they're these things about which they have a lot of remorse and, and shame and, and just feel terrible about that those those secrets right can be can be let out in group and and they can find support instead of more shame it, it's a very um it's a very healing process it's so many levels it's really powerful but it's all about empathy it's about helping that person break through 
and and I would say not rediscover, not re, not discover empathy, but like reconnect with their empathy. I think reconnect with the empathy that was there before the addiction um, did its did its job. So I love this next question too. Um, is it good to go to a group where you experience and are able to give empathy, but you can't be yourself within the group? For example, I've been to an evangelical church and the people are very nice and kind and, and loving and care, caring, um, but I feel forced to pray and believe as they do um, just to experience that empathy and connection. Um, but it feels horrible to me to say I believe Jesus is my savior when I don't believe that at all. But the people are so nice. I mean, that's a great question. What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, I think we're also hungry for connection and a belonging and, you know, a place where we feel comfortable, where we feel welcome. Um, and I think that's, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, we human beings need that. We need to be belong, to have a place where we belong. We need to have a purpose. We need to be connected to other people. And so I think we, we seek it out and it feels good when we get it. But if it's not um, resonating with you at a really authentic level, I, I think it's ultimately not going to be very beneficial for you because it's, I think in that, in that case where it's not kind of reciprocated, I mean, one of the beauties of empathy is that it, it's a two-way street. You start to feel it both ways. And if you're uh, you know, getting the love um, but, and want to reciprocate, but kind of it doesn't, it's not really authentic for you, I mean, ultimately, that can cause a problem. So I would, um, I, I applaud the your openness to receiving that because a lot of times people have trouble getting that. But I would encourage you maybe to explore um, contexts or situations where you can really do it authentically and feel comfortable in all the aspects and not not pay a price. And especially with something as important as, as spirituality and and uh, you're right, that connection feels great. You know, we all want it, um, but it has to be something that I think is is comfortable all the way down, you know, not just this kind of superficial surface level interaction. Yeah, you know, I would encourage you to explore some other religion slash spiritual experiences. Um, you know, when I lived in Boston, um, I had a, uh, my roommate at the time, she um, was kind of where you are and and somebody recommended that she went go to a, I think it was the Unitarian church there or something and she said the people were just as nice and just as caring without all the you know um, the Jesusy stuff which she struggled with and then out here I have a lot of friends we have we call it the spiritual center and it's sort of Buddhist sort of Christian sort of this sort of that and the people are really nice and they get together and they have these open and honest conversations about you know what a higher power is and what it should be and what it could be and what it isn't and and, and they help each other and they do what there's a lot of service work that happens uh out of our our, our, our spiritual center here um you know it's not my cup of tea but um i have a sponsee who goes regularly and he loves it um so there, there are tons of options out there um, where you can be fully vulnerable and fully receive empathy, which is what you, you're just not getting the full experience right now. I mean, I'm, I applaud you for getting some of the experience, but there's a richer, fuller experience out there somewhere for you. I agree. Um, yeah. So, and I'm not knocking anybody's religion or spiritual beliefs. If it works for you, great. Um, you know, don't let anybody tell you otherwise. But if it doesn't work for you, look for something else. Um, how do you know in an affair situation if it's a feeling of love or limerence? Another great question. So what is limerence, David? Yeah, so we'll start with that. So <laughs> limerence um, is a great term. It's It describes that very early phase of a relationship where you're kind of infatuated with the person, you're head over heels, you can't think of anybody else, you're texting 50 times a day and just calling and just obsessed. Um, I guess it's, it's an obsession of sorts. Uh, and, and it's chemical. It's not just an emotional thing. It's, it's you have oxytocin, which is the, the so-called love hormone sort of circulating through. It's, it, it's a bonding hormone. You, when you're experiencing oxytocin, you kind of want to bond. I mean, when mothers give birth to a baby, they have 
uh, both they and the baby's body has all kinds of oxytocin floating around it to, to create that bond. And so we get that, that's a high, it's a, it's a remarkable high actually when you first you know, get into a relationship or fall in love with somebody and, um, and it's a very definitely a mood altering uh, condition. Um, what we see though is that as our bodies regulate, which they do after several months, our kind of neurochemicals stabilize and we're not getting that high anymore. And a lot of people, uh, if they're love or romance addicts tend to sort of think, well, I've you know, fallen out of love, I need to find somebody else. And they'll, they'll jump from one relationship to another, but never progress very far in it because they, they're really uh, going for that, that mood altering state of, of limerence. So I think, um, I think maybe the best way to distinguish these, is it love or limerence would maybe be time. Um, I think there's a, a process we have to go through it, it, with getting to know somebody. And I think in the beginning, when you're in limerence, we, it's so easy to ignore the, the red flags and the warning signs and you know the like bad stuff that we can tend to overlook. And of course, when we are first meeting someone or getting to know someone, we, there's a whole bunch of stuff we don't know. So we just kind of fill in the blanks with what we imagine is the case. And, and just kind of, we paint a picture that, that may not be um, in any way accurate once the dust settles with who this person is. And so I think it's a really important process to take your time in that. But, but out of that, and I, I think love, I would say comes, if anything follows limerence. Love is in my mind a more kind of, a, has more depth, maybe more maturity, more three-dimensionality. Um, limerence is kind of this, um, it's like a sugar high when you first meet somebody and it's kind of, uh, it's intense and fabulous and, but it's, it doesn't last. I think love is much more, um, of a deeper thing, it's much more sustainable and um, it's the longer term view. So part of it's it's time, the timing of it. Um, part of it, I think love is a more kind of solid, grounded, deeper kind of emotion. Limerence to me is kind of a um, a quick high somehow. I don't want to cheapen it, but. Um, I mean, limerence I think is necessary. I think it's the glue that will hold us together long enough to get to know each other. And to, yeah, to see if there's anything more there, yeah. um, you know, and, and if, if, you know, I, I, I say the dirty underwear test, you know, when he tosses his dirty underwear on the floor and you just, and it doesn't bother you and you've been together for six months, it's probably love, uh, you know, I like the little things, you know, the, the pop in the gum or the whatever it is that's going to annoy you at some point when you're at a point where it should be annoying you and maybe it does annoy you, but not enough to break up, that, that might be love, you know? Um, because no relationship is perfect. No person is perfect. No person is not eventually annoying a little bit. Um, you know, and, and when you get down the line and, you know, somebody's annoying you, but you'd still rather be with them than not. Um, you know, I mean, liberance is all about right now too. And I think love is about, you know, when I'm 80, do I want to be sitting on the couch watching the news with you? Um, yeah. are, we, are we gonna, are we gonna enjoy that? Are we, you know, playing Jeopardy together or whatever it is, you know, when we're 80, I mean, you know, the, the, like the, yeah, that's, that's, but yeah, in, in affair situations, um, affairs, by the way, are just, just pure fantasy. Um, there is no dirty underwear. There is no who takes out the garbage. There is no, it's your turn to do the dishes in an affair. Affairs are dinner out and motel rooms and shows and fancy dresses and, and you know, that's an affair. That's not reality. <laughs> it's not a relationship. A relationship is, you know, all the other stuff too. Um, so yeah, affairs, limerence. I mean, it, they can last long enough. Maybe it's love, but um, you know, I, I just don't think affairs are real. They're fantasies. Right. I agree. Um, <laughs> um, since you talked a little bit about neurochemistry, I, I wanted to ask, this was another question I had. Um, does feeling empathy trigger a neurochemical pleasure response? And you've talked about like, you know, mother baby bonding with the oxytocin and serotonin. Do adults get that just by feeling empathy? Uh, even with somebody who's mad as hell at them sometimes? Yeah, you know, it's such an interesting point. And I think we know intuitively that yes, we do get a, a feel good, you know, pleasurable response from that feeling of being connected. 
um, we're just starting to understand how that actually works in the brain. You know, what, what, what's being activated, what chemicals are floating around. But I think it's a really important point in that, yes, um, it, there's a, a so-called reward for empathy. It feels good. And I think that, you know, earlier for the question about um, in, the, in the evangelical church where the person was getting kind of the love and support and, and just, but didn't quite believe in everything there. I think when we have that experience of empathy, um, we are connected and there is a reward there. And it, this is a natural need, I think, for us to, to feel connected, to belong. You know, when it, I do a lot of work, of course, with guys who use meth and cocaine as sex. And what they're always talking about, the, the meth guys particularly, they're, they're looking for a connection. You know, and, and I'm, I'm throwing cold water on it saying, well, it's a chemical connection, but, it, but, but the, the drive, I really respect the, the innate drive that we as humans have is to be, to be connected, to be a, a place where we belong, you know, a place where people know us. Sounds like a TV sitcom about a bar, doesn't it? Um, but uh, just to um, have that connection, that, that's something that we all have a need for and to kind of have a place where we're communal people by, you know, by history. And so I think to have that, it does give a rush. And I think we probably do get some dopamine and some other kind of feel good chemicals that keep us coming back for more because of course it feels good. If I can relate to somebody and really feel like we're kind of on the same page and um, that, that feels good. And that's, you know, the reward that we're talking about and dopamine and all that is really related to our survival as a species. The, the things that keep us um, functioning well as human beings and going forward. And that's certainly that ability to affiliate with people and collaborate and be connected and belong. That's all good for us uh, in terms of surviving. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's a reward for that. Yeah, and, and um, some of the guys in the drop-in groups that I moderate, um, you know, they'll come in and um, they do check-ins with their wives in the morning. They're trying to rebuild intimacy. And um, you know, sometimes the wife is mad at them and they'll share about, God, she was really mad at me today. And normally we check in for 10 minutes and went on for half an hour. And, and I'll say, you know, did you understand what she was saying? Oh, I totally got what she was saying. I totally got what she was mad. Um, you know, it's, you know, I don't think she should have been mad because it wasn't based in the present, but I'm like, but you got it, why she was mad and what she was feeling. Oh, I totally understood that. And then I say, how did that feel? And they think about it for a second and they say, it felt really good. And, and because they, they understood, even though they didn't agree with their wife being mad at them at that particular moment, they got why she was and they understood it and they, they, you know, they had some empathy for it. And it felt good for them, even when they were you know, taking some heat to actually get it. Um, and, and uniformly they say, you know, I'll say, did you express that to your wife? And yeah, I did. And, you know, how did you guys feel after this conversation? And they say, we felt really good. Um, you know, we felt closer. We felt really good. We had a nice breakfast, you know, we got it out. We felt it. We moved on. Um, I think there's some real power to empathy and building that intimacy that, that we all really want, which is really the pleasure that we all see. Exactly. So um, let's take let's take this last one here. This is a follow up to um, the evangelical question. Um, the thing is, I have developed friendships with these people, um, but I feel since I don't believe as they do that we shouldn't be friends or can't be friends. I'm saddened that I can't have my own views and keep them as friends. Um, I'm just going to say I think you can have your own views and keep them as friends, um, but I'll, I'll I'll let David. I'd like to yeah, I think I wouldn't make assumptions there. You know, I think um, people, you know, some people can be close-minded about stuff, but I think I would certainly, especially you're feeling it. I'm sure they're feeling it. You know, there's some good stuff going on there. I wouldn't throw it away automatically without maybe inquiring, exploring that and seeing, you know, maybe there's a way. I think one of the mistakes we get sometimes is that black and white thinking, it's either this or that. And usually there's a whole bunch of range of options in the middle. So I'd encourage you to kind of explore that before you just cut yourself off from um, these relationships that feel good and are mutually supportive. There may be a way to make it work. 
and, and be true to yourself with integrity. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm a huge, you know, my favorite cousin, uh, the cousin I'm closest to, he and I are on very, very, very opposite sides of the political fence. Um, and we just have kind of agreed to disagree and, you know, not make arguing about politics the basis of our, our, our relationship and we get along great. Um, and it's real um, because we're able to view that difference and, and say, okay, I think you're an idiot. <laughs> on that front, but I really like everything else about you. So we can still like be friends and, and get along just fine. Um, and you're not even on opposite sides of the fence here. You're just like, you know, like the Jesus thing is not for me. Um, you know, I think most evangelicals understand that their religion is not for everybody. Um, and that's okay. Um, I think you might find them to be more, at least I hope you would find them to be more supportive and willing to be friends than you might think, um, if you were willing to be honest. But I don't know, I could be completely wrong. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, anything you want to do? We're, we're out of time, everybody. Thank you. Um, we got through all of our questions today, so we did well. Um, anything you want to say to take us out, David? What a great topic. Yeah, just to remind everybody that empathy is a skill. You know, we can practice it and we can get better at it. It's not a thing we're born with or not. Uh, we can all develop it and practice it. Thank you. We'll be back next week. Um, bring some questions and um, we'll be happy to answer them for you. Same time, same place. Um, okay. Thank you, Scott. Good night. Good night.